well, hello. So before we begin, um, I just want to give you some insight into the process that led to the creation of the show. I'm not going to take long, don't worry. So I, I've been working as a developer advocate for the last year and a half. And if you're not familiar with what uh, developer advocates do, know that 50% of my time was dedicated to traveling around the world to attend conferences and to talk about software engineering. And as you can imagine, I'm not traveling anywhere anymore. And like me, a lot of people in the industry have had a, for, uh, a moment of forced self-reflection to try to answer questions about uh, the future of meetups and conferences. Um, this is not the first time the planet gets hit by a pandemic, so we can safely say that in-person events will eventually come back, uh, but it will take a while. And in the meantime, there's one big question that needs an answer. And that's what's a good way of translating meetups and conferences to a digital medium? What you're about to see is my answer to that question, which required me to face two big problems. The first one is the hardest problem in computer science, naming things, while the other I can safely say is the third hardest problem, right after cache invalidation and off by one errors. And that's recognizing when a problem cannot be solved by technology alone. I'd like to say thank you to all the speakers that took a chance and applied to come on a show whose format, while not outlandish, has never been attempted before as a deliberate evolution of meetups. Zig as a language is innovating on many aspects where others thought improvement would not be possible, and it's only fitting that a live show for the Zig community is equally daring. Um, this is the first episode, and while you could say that the show is already self-hosted, wink, uh, it's still far from complete, and as I get more skilled, I will introduce new elements and try to increase the level of entertainment. Uh, and also expect me to mess up a few things um, during the first tries. Well, so now I guess it's time to begin for real. I hope you're all excited, uh, but I kindly ask you to hold on to your pug champs until the right time. And don't worry, you will know when the right time comes. Hi, my name is Loris Crow, and we are executing a Showtime. Zig Showtime is the show where we got a complete game live on stream. Uh, no, sorry, wrong, wrong line. Zig Showtime is the show where members of the Zig community come on stream to share coded ideas with the broader public. Every episode features two speakers who will present and take questions from you, the viewers. Zig Showtime is not just what you're seeing on the live stream, but also the discussions that you can have while watching. And that's why I encourage you to join one of the existing Zig communities that you can find by going to zinglang.org. Today's episode features Benjamin Feng, who will talk uh, about writing emulators in Zig. And after Benjamin, Isaac Freund uh, will talk about writing a Wayland compositor in Zig as a newcomer to the language. And finally, Andrew Kelly, the creator of Zig, is going to share a couple of thoughts with us. So now, hold tight, uh, because I need to set up everything with the speaker, and it's the first time I'm doing so. So yeah, give me a second.
Okay, we're ready. So while Benjamin mainly works with JavaScript, he's also interested in systems programming. And now thanks to WebAssembly, he's able to experience uh, the expressiveness of assembly code coupled with the efficiency of JavaScript. And he wrote a game, Boy Emulator, which if I understood correctly, works best in uh, on Internet Explorer 6. Is this correct? Well, he will tell us. The talk is Zig, a, a great fit for emulators. And so Benjamin, the stream is yours. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you for writing all of this. This is awesome. And uh, yeah, so I wrote an emulator. It's a Game Boy emulator and it runs on uh, in the browser. And you can access it at this URL here. And I'm just going to um, show it off while it uh, demos um, Super Mario Brothers while, while I go through this talk. And just a quick uh, overview of my emulator called Fun Dude. Um, it's a pun on Game Boy. If you, uh, because naming things is hard. And it's basically a uh, my first emulator ever that I wrote in Zig, and it is running in WebAssembly. And um, it's actually also my first Zig program that I've ever really written, and it's my first WebAssembly. So this is kind of a series of firsts for me. And um, I've been programming for about like 10, 15 to 12 years now, and I've um, originally started with C, so this is actually my, um, my, my emulator that I ported over from C into Zig. So uh, C was my previous uh, systems level programming of, uh, language of choice. And uh, it's, it sort of has a fond, uh, uh, I have a fondness in my heart, but I also recognize that there are many problems. And um, part of the reason I'm learning Zig is that I want to see if it solves all, most of those problems. And I like to think that it does. And uh, just a quick overview of uh, Zig and what it does. It is a lot more modern language. So uh, it just comes with a lot more um, better designs that we have learned in the past 50 years, because C is a very old language at this point. And these are also features in other modern languages that uh, most, 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 uh, most of them also solve these. So I'm not going to get into these too much in detail, but all of these uh, help uh, tremendously in, in working on the emulator. So what I will do is go over some of the uh, more nuanced things that I find that Zig actually helps uh, really well in terms of mapping these uh, low level programming into something like an uh, emulator. And the first thing is that Zig prefers explicitness and whenever there's an amb ambiguous case, uh, the usual default to Zig is to compile error or to runtime error, uh, whichever makes the most sense. And a good example here are ambiguous casts. And um, this is, uh, this is uh, a version of my um, of a signed ad that I previously wrote in C. And in C, uh, we have a concept that we can cast uh, numbers around. And one of the many downsides of C is that even though you have a, uh, uh, quite a few different number types, they, they all sort of cast into each other. And the rules are really complicated. And it's not actually obvious what's happening here. Like what I want to do is I want to convert B. Right now it's an unsigned integer. I want to convert it to a signed integer. Um, so I actually have an explicit conversion here. So um, Anything over 127 is actually a negative number in signed, signed in format. It's two's complement. And I need to uh, go ahead and convert that to a subtraction. And then I need to go and add, um, add it in with the original value. And I actually don't know what's going on here. I am looking back at the code and I realize that this is like, this has two different ways of doing um, implicit casting as well as undefined behavior at the very end down here. Um, Actually, I think two undefined behaviors. The add is undefined, and then the return is also undefined. So there's a lot of bad things going on. And in C, I actually didn't know any of this was happening. I just spat this out because uh, it seemed like it worked. And it does work in my compiler, but that doesn't mean that it's good code. And when I converted it to Zig, Zig actually f forced me to go fix all of all the problems. And at first, it was really annoying um, because there were so many problems with the code. It was just very hidden. And in Zig, uh, what uh, ended up happening is that uh, my final attempt, I actually implemented in a way that uh, makes a lot more, is a lot clearer, um, because uh, you actually see what's, what I'm trying to do here. I, I just convert the uh, B into a, a signed integer, and then I convert A into a signed integer, and the only implicit cast here is uh, converting this um, 
8-bit integer into a 16-bit integer. And that's actually very well defined. So a negative 1 from an 8-bit integer will convert to a negative 1 in 16-bit. There's, there's no problem there. And um, I don't even want to think about that. Uh, and I don't have to because Zig automatically casts that for me. All the other casts are, are explicit and for very good reasons. And I think that this is just a better representation of the problem um, because Zig gives me the capability of representing this. And it also like prevents a lot of weird issues that were coming from the C side because of, because of the explicitness. And even though I had my reservations of the explicitness, I've really come around to enjoying um, how, how the language forces you to just write better code. And another thing that Zig does really well is exposing compiler intrinsics. And um, let's let's take a look at the example code first. Uh, this is this was in C. This is also valid Zig syntax. And the only thing I'm not really showing is that the CMP is a uh, is a packed struct. So what this means is that each of these fields is actually one bit wide. So what I'm doing here is that I'm trying to find the first um, the first bit that's active. And once I detect whichever bit that is, then I will uh, jump to this address. And this is an interrupt handler. So these interrupts are, are ordered. And if you have a V blank interrupt and a joypad interrupt at, active at the same time, the V blank will fire first. And this one will just disappear until like whenever the next uh, interrupt cycle handles. And this works. There's, there's nothing wrong with this code. It's just very slow. This, is, this actually runs every cycle on the Game Boy. And, and because of that, this actually is, what, five branches with uh, two or three instructions each. And that really is a performance hog. And I, I benchmarked this, and I realized that this was actually taking up a non, like 15 20% of my CPU cycle, which is actually not uh, quite a bit for something so small. So in Zig, what I'm able to do is, uh, is actually convert this into a much simpler program. And this is purely because of how Zig exposes compiler intrinsics. And compiler intrinsics are a low-level detail of a compiler. And C actually has this, but C compiler intrinsics are not built into the language. It's built into the compiler. And I actually didn't know about these things before I started working with Zig. So in terms of what all of this means is that um, there are two there are two intrinsics that I'm actually using bitcast, which is uh, which is sort of available in C but not really, and then um, CTZ, which is uh, definitely available in uh, Clang and GCC, and it depends on your compiler. Now CTZ does uh, count terminating zeros, so this is actually going to count the number of zeros that are happening starting from the least uh, significant bit. So this is actually maps directly to here, where V blank is the uh, least significant bit, and joypad is, uh, I think, number five. So I just go and count the number of bits, and then I convert that to a straight math equation, and there's only one branch. And this, I think, is around four cycles and one branch, which is far easier for the compiler to, or for the CPU to execute. And this uh, improved the performance uh, quite a bit. And um, this is because I am able to use the CTZ. And uh, again, this is available in C. It's just not very obvious. And if you look at standard documentation, you won't find this because it's not a part of the C standard. It's a part of the uh, compilers. And um, I actually didn't know that that was a thing. Whereas in, in Zig, we actually expose a lot of these compiler er, intrinsics into the reference documentation. And I believe that this is most of these will exist going forward in the Zig compiler. So this is a lot more readily available. And I think that because Zig is a more modern language, it is able to expose a lot of these things. And um, C was written in the 70s, and it was designed to run on a PDP-7, which is an ancient, ancient piece of uh, architecture. And there's a few, few references online that talk about how, how like, modern C doesn't actually map to a, uh, a modern assembly anymore. And one of the reasons is that it doesn't actually expose a lot of these uh, new things that CPUs have. And lastly, uh, this is going to be a bit more in-depth, but uh, Zig enables more control of bytes. And I'm just going to give a quick overview of how the Game Boy works in internally. And uh, when the uh, Game Boy has eight 8-bit eight registers and uh, around six-ish 16-bit uh, registers. And this looks pretty familiar if, you're, uh, um, if you are familiar with the uh, x86 architecture, because x86 is built off of the Intel 8080, of which Game Boy also builds off the Intel 8080. And the, uh, the processor is an 8-bit logical processor with a 16-bit memory bus. 
And that means that the processor needs to address both 8 bits for doing math and 16 bits for doing memory manipulation. And how that works in the Game Boy is that it creates these registers, uh, these 8-bit uh, registers, A, B, C, D, H, F, H, F, and L. And I went all over the place with that order. But, um, but you can also refer, refer to these uh, registers as 16-bit uh, as registers. And that'll be the AF register, the BC register, DE, and HL. They're literally just two registers glued together. And those actually occupy the same space in memory, which means that in order to represent that in an emulator, we have to somehow represent both B, C, and BC all together in one memory space. And how this is uh, traditionally done in a C-like language is that people will recommend you create just 16-bit registers. So like the AAF register is a 16-bit value and BC and on and on. And this works, but you get into the problem of how do I access the A register? Well, you need to do some bit shifts. So you need to shift, uh, you need to mask the AF register and shift it right by eight bits. And that's kind of annoying. And then when you set it, you also have to do the same. And that's really easy to get wrong. So you end up starting creating these getters and setters. And the F register is actually special because it's it's the flag register. It has uh, four bit flags that are relevant. So in order to get at those, you need more getters and setters and uh, on and on. And this is code that I really don't want to write. This is, the reason why I like using a good programming language is that I should be able to represent this idea in the language itself, and um, this would really annoy me. Um, and, but but this is sort of the recommended approach because this is actually the only way you can do this reasonably with, within the C standard guidelines. Uh, this is not what I did um, my first pass in C. What I did was I actually used a union, and I used a union with a bunch of structs with a bunch of bit fields. And uh, in a union, you share memory space, so the AF um, field actually shares the same space as this bottom field right here, which is a separate A and F. And F is broken down into bit flags, and we have an additional padding in order to align it properly. And this works, sort of. Now, there are many problems with it. If you've noticed, I created this int4. Um, that's because I didn't really want to get into the details of uh, C. Uh, C doesn't have an int4 type that does not exist. Uh, you have to use uh, bit flags for that. Uh, but more importantly, none of these fields are actually going to align properly. And that's because in C, um, the compiler is allowed to pad your fields however it want to. And in order to turn off padding, you need to use uh, compiler extensions, which make it not, not as portable as it should be. So uh, GCC and Clang has a way of telling these attributes to be packed. But that's, again, not a part of the spec. Um, so in order for this to work, I have to sacrifice portability, uh, which I'm fine with. Uh, but again, like some people are uh, very much against using this type of st this style, and a lot of recommendations says you shouldn't use bit fields. The other more sinister problem is that um, most people wouldn't notice this, but unions are actually not not spec'd out to do this. Like the only thing that a union is allowed to do is that they share bytes. And if you use one field, that field is guaranteed to have the same, same memory space. If you try to cross between fields, so if I stick something in the AF register or the AF field here, and I try to access A, that's actually undefined behavior by the C spec. Now, I don't know of any compiler that makes it, makes it do anything other than accessing the correct memory space, but technically it's against spec. So again, there's a lot of undefined behavior going on that it's not really apparent that it exists. And lastly, um, this is more of an internal problem, but like architecturally, there's a, there's a problem with uh, doing this. Now, I can refer to these registers as either the field name, which is AF, A and F, or I can, uh, or I can refer to them as a pointer value. Um, so if I, um, if I try to save uh, which register I'm using, I have to use a pointer into AF. And both of those work, and neither of them are optimal because well, first off, pointers cannot be serialized properly. So if I'm trying to dump the CPU and I'm trying to dump a state of execution, I can't actually dump pointers because as soon as I try to uh, unserialize that, the pointer values are just totally wrong. Um, it also gets in more, uh, more bigger problems when I'm trying to do a disassembly. And if I just have a pointer, um, I have to look up what that pointer means, and then I have to do an offset calculation compared to the struct, which again is more undefined behavior. 
So what I really wanted to do is that I want to standardize it by offset. So if I could refer to all of these by offset, then everything would work out. Um, so here, uh, I, I written out what I really wanted to do, and I have a list, uh, an array of 16-bit registers, array of 8-bit uh, registers, and then the flag here that just sits, sits at the bottom. And this would work. Like, AF would be an offset of 0, BC would be an offset of 1, which will actually be 2 bytes here, uh, because this is a 16-bit array. And that would definitely work. And similarly, it would work uh, down here because, um, and these are backwards because of little Indian. But that, that's OK. That's an internal detail that we can just uh, ignore for now. And all this works, except the problem in C now is that if you do this by arrays, you're just going to get numbers out. And in order for us to work with them, we're going to have to just work with ints. And it's really easy for me to accidentally pass a 0, or if I pass a 0 from, uh, this, red, from this array into this array. And that accidentally crossing these registers is a very common problem because I have 256 instructions. It's very easy for me to make a typo, call it B, uh, B instead of VC or something. And all of a sudden, I just have garbage coming out. And it's not really obvious why. And that's because uh, enums are just ints in C. And how I would solve that in Zig is actually really easy. I just use an enum array. And the solution didn't actually come to me until I started using um, I started using uh, Zig because enum arrays were a very easy concept. Uh, this is doing a little bit of generic to comp time, but uh, because enum arrays don't exist at the language itself, but that's okay. And this will basically make it almost impossible for me to cross these values because everything's accessible by enums now instead of by numbers. So if I try to stick an F into, um, into this 16-bit uh, register, I will just get a compiler error. And that's exactly what I want my compiler to do. Um, these types and these uh, values should be guiding, um, guiding my, um, my design, and Zig allows me to do that. And I think that because of all these features, Zig has a very strong capability of, uh, of just being able to represent all of these problems. And I think that Zig has enough power to do all of the, th the things that I needed, needed to do to represent my problems while simultaneously being simple enough that I, I don't have to be constantly fighting the language. And this is why I really like working with Zig. And um, just a quick uh, overview of uh, FunDude, my, uh, my actual emulator. Uh, I got the CPU working and, and the videos working. Interrupts and timers, uh, interrupts that uh, I believe work and timers are a little bit untested, but these are sort of the core pieces to get me working. So, a lot of a lot of different games do run Mario, as you see. Uh, Zelda, Pokemon also runs. Um, um, so everything just it does work, uh, but it's again it's a work in progress. So there's many parts that are missing. Uh, saves are a big problem. Save states something that I definitely want to support. It doesn't exist. Audio uh, it's not muted. It just doesn't exist right now. And uh, serial port is something that I really want to start tackling. And this actually will enable online play, which is something that I think might be a killer feature for this. I don't actually know of, of, uh, about other emulators, but it'd be nice if we could just be able to play like two-player Tetris over the internet and have zero setup. I think that would be an awesome thing. Or like trade Pokemon. That would be uh, pretty amazing. So none of those things work yet. They're all in progress. And um, I can be found sometimes streaming uh, my progress. Um, I've been doing this for a couple of weeks now, and this emulator's been, oh, uh, I've been working on this emulator for uh, over a year now. So it's definitely a work in progress. And um, I, I, I'm just very happy with how things are turning out with Zig, even though it is a pretty young and pretty um, unstable language, it has been forcing me to do a lot of things that I wouldn't have even known. So I'm really happy with progress so far. So that is, that is fun dude. And that is my experience with Zig. Thank you very much. Wow. Uh, thank you, Benjamin. That talk was amazing. Thank you very much. I would also uh, doubly recommend to check out uh, twitch.tv slash Um I, he's unfortunately is in a time zone that's a bit hard for me <laughs> to <laughs> uh, always be able to see, uh, to attend live, but um, especially uh, if, if you're from the United States, um, um, it's going to be awesome. Uh, thank you again. Uh, it's time to move to the Q&A now. Um, so, uh, let me um, 
let me remind everybody how the Q&A works. So if you have a question for Benjamin, you have three ways of letting me know. Uh, the first is Twitch chat. Uh, well, let's avoid orders. You have Twitch chat, you have the Zig IRC channel on Freenode, and you have the Zig programming language uh, Discord server uh, in the general channel. Uh, in all cases, remember to tag me uh, in your question so that I, you know, I, I can see it more easily. Uh, and I'm Christoph in in all of uh, in all of these three places. Um, so yeah, uh, let's switch to the Q and A view. Uh, and in the meantime, that people start typing their questions. So um, Benjamin, uh, let me start with a, a bit of a default question. Let's say, uh, how did you discover Zig? What's your Zig story? Uh, so I've been. Um, my original exposure to Zig is on uh, Hacker News. I saw a quick post. I think it was when um, Andrew uh, quit his uh, day job uh, from from OKCupid, and um, I've been working, find, trying to look for something to replace C for a while. It's not the best language, and it shows. However, I've also been fed up of, of every other language that I've used, including C++ and Rust even. So when Zig came on the radar, I was like, hey, that's something I should keep in mind. And then when I decided to work on an emulator, I decided to, hey, Z I think that's a perfect time to try out Zig. OK, I see. Um, so we have uh, one question on, on Twitch. Um, so. Uh, well, I think you mentioned some reasons why you prefer Zig over C. Um, uh, are there any others other than the ones that uh, you described earlier? Yeah. So um, some of the things I didn't really touch on, um, uh, compile time, uh, getting rid of macros and using comp time is a big feature. I don't actually do that too often in my emulator, so I wasn't able to really demo, demo it. But there are many, many areas where we could uh, leverage comp time to design a better. Um, uh... All right, sorry. Um, there are many times where we can leverage comp time to design a, a just better code because we're able to have a much more powerful macro system. Or macros are the wrong word. Um, much more powerful metaprogramming system. Okay. Uh, <laughs> other things are just getting rid of uh, undefined behavior. I think that uh, I sort of glossed over this, but like um, Zig has uh, much more strict definitions of undefined behavior. And this is not to say that C was wrong. Uh, C was actually, the reason why undefined behavior existed is because the C spec didn't exist for a while, and by the time they started writing one, they had to rectify all the compiler issues. So there's a historical reason why that happens. Whereas in Zig, it's a lot more well-defined and more explicit. And um, there are actually, most of the time, there are ways around it. Whereas in C, it basically, the, um, the language just sort of gives up and be like, you're on your own. In Zig, we have things like overflow operator, where it forces a certain behavior, um, or there are like ways to catch the errors and then do it better. Uh, sometimes it's done with the standard library. Um, the standard library is another great thing that I think is is awesome in Zig. Um, the fact that Zig supports freestanding makes uh, porting over to WebAssembly amazing. Um, with C, I had to go and find a compatible libc in order to like build out something. I had to find a compatible malloc and um, do all these uh, j weird juggles in order to get WebAssembly working. And if, if that didn't exist solely for WebAssembly, I wouldn't be able to do that. Whereas in, in Zig, uh, most of the standard libraries available on any target, including freestanding. And the thing that was missing was just malloc. And I actually wrote my own memory allocator, which is pretty pretty um, straightforward in Zig. I shouldn't call it easy, but it definitely, there's a lot of nuances, but it seemed a lot easier to um, tackle than something like C, where I wouldn't even know where to begin when writing something like malloc. So I think there's a lot of benefits just you know, working with, C, uh, with, with uh, Zig over C. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, there's another question from IRC. So uh, what's the number one issue in Zig that you would like to see addressed, uh, which would help with uh, Fundud? Uh, number one issue is probably pack structs. Um, there are many bugs with pack structs, and uh, even though I do know about a lot of them, uh, it still has uh, been a problem when I rediscover them. And um, it, it's definitely just a bug, but it's something that I would uh, I would love to see fixed so that we don't ever encounter that again. Um, the, the issue is that pack structs don't work 
if you're crossing byte boundaries or press crossing uh, natural word boundaries. So like in WebAssembly, if you have a, a type that tries to go across one byte, uh, it'll be padded in a weird way that the, uh, the compiler doesn't really like. So you're sort of stuck with doing anything under one byte or um, automatically pad it up to like four bytes, which can get pretty annoying and tricky. And especially if you don't know that that's happening, which has happened on, on a few occasions. So that's probably my biggest uh, complaint right now. But again, it is a bug. It's not a design flaw. And it's, it's well known. And a lot of people recommend avoiding pack structs, which I can definitely understand. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Um, another question. Uh, so what is the compile to wasm experience in Zig? Um, yeah, sure. Um, let me pull up a code. Um, okay, so you want me really easy. You want me to so, show the screen? Uh, am I not showing anything? Uh, well, it's in a different view. Uh, you're right. You don't know oh. this. Uh, I, uh, let me switch back to the previous view. Yeah, now uh, we can see your desktop. Okay. Um, so the biggest thing is that um, Zig doesn't offer a, a standard ABI um, or a uh, which sorry, Zig uh, by default doesn't have a stable ABI. So I needed to create uh, wrapper functions around everything in order to expose it. So like I needed to do the exports in C. I just sort of did that did this manually, uh, which would work uh, well. But in Zig, it doesn't work. Uh, it, we need um, we need a concept of uh, standardizing this because there are types that don't exist in um, in outside of Zig. For instance, slices don't exist, so I have to convert it into uh, raw pointers. Um, once I did that, and then um, it was as easy as going into my build and creating this whole like setting the target as WebAssembly 32 and freestanding and um, the other caveat is you have to make sure you're not using any operating system based uh, based uh, libraries, which um, you can accidentally do. Probably the biggest problem is the debug.warn requires standard out, which requires an operating system, which doesn't exist in WebAssembly. And um, sometimes those error messages can be a little tricky if you don't know what's wrong with that. But other than that, like everything else just works. Um, as long as you're in um, Zig land, everything just works as Zig, and I don't even have to care about WebAssembly. And it's only sort. It's only this special file that actually does uh, most of the wrapping. So like errors don't cross the boundaries. I have to manually wrap the errors. Uh, everything has to be in pointer um, because um, number. Uh, the only types that are available in WebAssembly are uh, uh, in thirty-two, in sixty-four, float thirty-two, and float sixty-four. Every other type doesn't exist. So pointers are uh, in thirty-two, so that works, and then float sixty-four. And you just have to make sure that you're crossing the ABI boundary correctly. And once you're doing that, everything just just works. And it works pretty well. And I, I'm really happy with how everything turned out. OK, cool. Um, uh, we have a few more questions. So another one is, how did you pick up Zig so well? Um, uh, so this is from Timmy. Uh, I finished the master doc, uh, but I find myself um, struggling behind that. Behind that. Uh, did you read the Zig standard library code? Um, yeah, so part of it is that I do, I did uh, come from, I, I do have a bit of experience with C, and uh, Zig ac actually maps really well to almost any other low-level language, um, of which C is one of those. So if you're, uh, so that's pro part of the I I re issue is that a lot of the existing resources online just sort of assume um, C, C familiarity. So if you do have C, uh, that you do get a sort of a quick uh, leg up on everything. Um, the other thing, I, I, I hang out in IRFC, I ask questions a lot, but also like getting familiar with the standard library, reading the code. It's actually very good code. Um, most, most of the code is fairly readable and fair, uh, fairly straightforward, and they don't require a lot of things. And um, just getting familiar with how, how the code is structured there is, a, is I think, a very powerful uh, thing. And, a lot of a lot of languages actually offer a similar thing. If you look at some of the Java code or Python standard library, you can probably follow a lot of them. Unfortunately, like C and C plus plus standard library code can be very hard to follow. So I can definitely um, understand that if you're hesitant to like open up some of those sources, um, it, it it can be pretty daunting. But with Zig, um, my I would say that because of the way that the language is structured, it's very regular and very like. Um, uh, 
factory like in in a good way like a lot of zig code just looks very similar to each other when i pull up like code from the from like say the zls it looks very familiar and it doesn't take a lot of effort for me to read so that's another strong point of zig is that the code tends to tends to follow pretty um pretty similar patterns so once you get pretty familiar with reading like standard library almost any code can be followed unless it's like designed to be very tricky, which it, it can be, but like that's more on, on the programmer than on the language at that point. Okay. Uh, okay, two questions, um, and then I think uh, we can move forward. Um, I'm looking for a short answer to, um, have you had any challenges to the fact that Z is so young and in development? Yes, and there are many challenges. There are lots of bugs that happen. Uh, many of them, some of them, I, I would say most of them have either documented behavior or they have an error message saying, hey, this is the bug in the zip compiler. Um, the bigger problems are sort of the hidden bugs that happen. Like, for instance, my pack struck uh, bug, uh, it was just working until it wasn't one day and I had no idea why and it took like half an hour to an hour to just figure out the source of it. Um, there are quite a few just compiler bugs. I've created uh, many of them in, in uh, GitHub issues over the course uh, of my usage of it. Uh, the language iterates very often. Um, so it's been nice since the 0 0.6 release that the language itself and the um, standard libraries hasn't changed all that much. But especially with the 0 0.5 release cycle, we were breaking things like every week. And it can be very hard to follow if, you, if you're not aware of these things that are happening. So if you're expecting a language that will stay stable in any way, shape, or form, Zig is not it. Uh, if you have the time and the patience to follow it and work through the bugs and to um, um, just be patient with uh, the creator, again, it's, a, it's mostly a one-man shop. Um, I, we have many contributors over the language, but um, Andrew is the only one that's getting paid for this, and he does a great job, but he is still just one person. So um, it takes a lot of effort for even him to fo to f keep up with the PRs and to follow through uh, with uh, things. So um, for for your average person, yeah, we we can. It, it can be pretty tricky to um, keep up with everything, and there are times where my emulator break broke, and it took me a while to hunt down just because the language has iterated. And that hap that that that'll keep happening at least uh, for for the foreseeable future. I I, I have heard that um, we want to keep it a little bit more stable soonish rather than later. And zero point seven I think was dubbed a more stability stability focused um, release cycle. So maybe we can see a, a little bit uh, less uh, breaking changes over over the tail end of the development cycle before it reaches one point But again, there's no guarantees. Yeah. And uh, final question, um, this is from Two Step. Any big lessons learned writing the emulator? So I don't think there would, like other than me learning the language and learning low level programming, I'm not sure that there would be any other big lessons. I, I, I think part of it is just that me learning how hardware and emulator works and trying to work around the, the kinks of synchronizing different pieces. Um, all of those are applicable everywhere. But, uh, um, so definitely something that I learned. I've also learned a lot about just bitwise manipulation because uh, Zig offers a lot of great resources for that. And um, other things, just uh, how to performance tune and try to speed things up. Just basic. I think they, they would be considered basic low-level programming that I wasn't exposed to uh, before working with um, working with uh, writing my own emulator. Because um, again, I did mostly ap application level development and uh, all this low-level stuff I knew existed. I just didn't really have the time or the effort to uh, to learn all of, all of the idiosyncrasies of what to do about like cache misses and branch prediction. Um, but I don't think those are specific to emulator. Um, so I, I might be the wrong person to ask about specifically what, what emulation would bring to the table. Um, but I do, I do feel like I learned a lot working on the simulation and a lot of it is just basic low level programming. Okay. Awesome. Well, 
Thank you very much. Uh, don't leave Discord just yet. Uh, stick around for a while longer while I do the um, outro because we are now moving uh, to the break. Uh, so there's a 10 minute break. The timer is starting now. And uh, after that, we will uh, have the second session with uh, Isaac Freund and his Wayland compositor. Uh, so thank you everyone and be right back.
Okay, break is over. Um, before we continue, uh, I want to say thank you to Soul Serpent and Veritas JS. Thank you for gifting um, Soul Serpent 10 tier one um, uh, subscriptions and Veritas uh, five tier one subscriptions. Thank you very much, guys. Um, uh, it's much appreciated. Um, so let's move to the next session. Okay, so the next speaker is Isaac Freund. Isaac is studying computer science in Aachen, Germany. And while most of his courses, uh, most of the courses in his university are about theory, he spends the bulk of his free time playing around with Linux and Wayland, which is more or less the same as what I did in university if you replace Linux with Dota and Wayland with Counter-Strike. Um, anyway, uh, the talk is writing a Wayland compositor in Zig, and so Isaac, the room is yours. All right, thank you, Christoph. Welcome to my talk on writing a Wayland compositor in Zig. And so I imagine many of you might be asking right now, what is Wayland? So I'm going to explain that to you before we continue. So Wayland is nothing more than a protocol for communication between a compositor and Wayland clients. And so this is meant to be a replacement for X11. If you do not already know, X11 is the display server used by Linux and other Unix-like systems today. It is what clients or applications on your computer use to talk to the, to display something on the screen or get access to input and events from your keyboard or mouse. This, this display server is responsible for managing all the output and input of your computer. So how is Wayland different from X11? Let's look at this nice diagram taken from the Wayland website. So in X, we have um, the X server, which is the, a single server. There's only one implementation of the X server. And the, everything else is an X client. And then the X server is the only thing that talks to the kernel. And using the kernel mode setting and EVDev APIs um, controls the output and input of your hardware. And then it talks to all the clients. The compositor is just another X client, your, your window manager or, or a compositor to like apply some fancy effects to your screen. However, on Wayland, all the, the display server and the compositor become one single program. And this simplifies things greatly because now there's not as much back and forth required to render one thing. Here, when an X client wants to draw something, it has to X, ask the X server, would you please draw this? And then the X server will have to talk to the compositor about where this is going to be drawn and how it's going to be drawn before it actually gets drawn on the, on the, by sending messages to the kernel. And Wayland, the, you can see there's a lot less back and forth. The pipeline is just Wayland clients to compositor to kernel to the kernel mode setting API. So that makes things a lot simpler. However, it's obviously not very easy to write Wayland compositor if you have to do everything at once. You're not don't you don't get to rely on the X server to do the heavy lifting for you. You've got to implement everything you want in your compositor directly. And so luckily there's a library called WL Roots that will help us out to do this. So what is WL Roots? It is a modular library for writing Wayland compositors. This means that you can use as much or as little of it as you want, and it won't. It will get out of your way when you want to take control. As also, as it describes itself in this readme, it's 50,000 lines of code you were going to write anyways. So these these are the the code that would be shared between almost every Wayland implementation, and. This is developed and used by the Sway project, which is, if you do not know, Sway is probably the largest Wayland compositor out there today, aside from GNOME and KDE. It's what I have been using until I decided to start work on my own project because I wasn't quite happy with some of the ways Sway does things and wanted to have my windows managed a little differently. And so Sway, LibWayland, and WLRoots are all written in NC. And so as I'm setting out to write my own Wayland compositor, the first thing I need to do is choose a language, right? And so the first criteria is that it needs to be able to talk to these C Wayland libraries, including WL Roots. Furthermore, it has to be fast because if your display server is slow, that's gonna slow down everything else in your computer. That means garbage collection is a big no-no. We cannot have any performance compromises here because the more performance, the more resources your display server takes up, the less is left over for everything you actually want to get done with your computer. Third, this language needs to be simple. A Wayland compositor is a non-trivial program. It's quite complex, even though the protocol itself is simpler than the X11 protocol. And so we need a language that's simple enough that the code is easy to understand and easy to maintain. 
And finally, we want the language to make it easy to write correct code. And that means, because nobody wants to use a display server that's got bugs. If your display server is crashing or has buggy behavior, that makes your computer unusable and nobody wants to use it. I wouldn't want to use it either. And so the first option, like the obvious choice would be to just use C. This is what may, all the success, many of the successful compilers currently use. A couple of use, are using C++, but C is the what Sway, GNOME, and KDE are all using. So let's let's go through here. Obviously, C has good interoperation with C Wayland libraries, and it is fast. It's the standard most languages are measured against when you're comparing for speed. And C is relatively simple. There's a lot of legacy stuff, but it does not have, it's not a language that would take a lifetime to understand all the intricacies of, and you're not as much debugging your knowledge of the language as your knowledge of your code. However, it's not easy to write correct code in C. C has null pointers. C has lots of implicit conversions and some nasty undefined behavior that will bite you. And so one might be tempted to say, what about Rust? I've heard about this memory safe language that's supposed to solve all my problems with null pointers and whatnot. However, it, and it is very easy to write correct code in Rust because the compiler will not let you compile incorrect code. And Rust is pretty fast. There's no garbage collection, but it cannot really talk to C Wayland libraries well. And so when you're starting, when you're setting out to write something in Rust, the first thing you need to do if you want to use a C library is either write bindings yourself or find someone else who's already written Rust bindings. Because writing Rust bindings to a C library is non-trivial trivial if you want to take advantage of Rust safety guarantees. And it's not too hard to write unsafe bindings in which you use unsafe Rust if you just use the C library APIs directly. But if you're using unsafe Rust, you might as well not be using Rust because then you lose out on the safety guarantees it makes. And so are there any safe WL roots bindings out there? Well, this project was attempted by WayCooler, which is another compositor project who attempted to write a, a, a Wayland compositor in Rust. However, they gave up on the safe WL roots bindings after over a thousand commits and over a year of work just on writing the bindings to use Rust with WL roots. And this is nothing against them. They are very capable programmers and know far more about Rust and WL roots than I do, I'm sure. But it is not a non-trivial thing to wrap this API in a safe way because pointer lifetimes in Wayland conflict very strongly with Rust memory management. And Rust memory model wants to have everything known at compile time so it can be statically checked by the compiler. But in Wayland uh, from, and WL roots, these pointers can become the invalidated at runtime. For example, if you suddenly unplug your monitor from your computer, then W roots, that means that your this pointer will, you will receive an event that says your output has disappeared and this pointer will become invalid. And it's very hard to wrap that kind of API in Rust in a safe way that avoids runtime checks. And so if you want to read more about their story and with details of trying to wrap this API in Rust, you can read more about it here. And so th this is not to say that it's absolutely impossible. However, I think it's become clear that wrapping this API in safe Rust is not going to be simple. And so using Rust also does not check this last checkbox of simplicity. And so is there a better alternative? And this is when I came across Zig. I read I believe I first read about it on Lobsters or Hacker News or something. And I started reading through the website and saw an example of importing uh, libsound.io and just using it instantly with, from just importing C code into your Z code. And so I thought, why not try this out? So it doesn't have good interop with C Wayland libraries. So let's go look for an example here. So this is something that gives gave Rust a good bit of trouble. So let's, this is very C-ish code that's in Wayland. So here we have a WL listener. In Wayland, you're, the whole idea of Wayland is very callback based, meaning that um, the server sends events to the clients and the clients make requests to the server. And so you, have, you register a callback with the library to listen for any requests made by clients. And you do that using this WL listener struct. And so this is, and this is made up of a, no, a notify function is a, a type def for a, the type of this notify function. We'll get into that in just a second. And a link in a WL list. A WL list is an intrusive link, doubly linked list, 
which just has two members, a link to the previous and a link to the next. And so this tells us that this struct cannot move in memory, otherwise we would break this pointer in the list and invoke some nice C undefined behavior. And so this struct must be pinned in memory and we have to um, deal with this, doubly link, with this intrusive link list. And so let's this an example usage in C. We have our server struct that will hold our listener and a bunch of other fields probably. And we will register a callback um, to find if this callback, this is the, the function pointer type we have here. And it will take a listener and a void pointer to some data that comes along with the callback. And the, so we we just, all we get is the pointer to the listener this callback is registered on. So how do we get access to our server struct and the rest of our stuff? So we have this pattern. This is the, a, a nice C macro, WL container of. So what is this thing doing? So we pass it this pointer to the listener. We pass it a under, a un, um, initialized pointer to a server. And we pass it, what is this? This is the field name of the, member of our struct that this listener is. This is a pointer to this member of a struct somewhere in memory. And we pass it, we, this, this macro now gets the type of the struct and it gives, get, we get this pointer to this memory. And so this is able to then conjure a pointer to this server struct that owns this listener as a field. And so this, this is a little bit complicated, a little bit hard to translate to non-C languages. And so this is, this is the kind of the bread and butter of Wayland APIs, though that everything is callback based, and so this is a pattern that happens all the time in Wayland. And we're also just casting this nice void pointer into the data that the Lib Wayland has told us we will get with this callback. And so let's briefly look at how this could look. In, and this is the, this is the definition of the C macro. Yeah, so this is from Lib Wayland. You can see it's just doing pointer math. It's taking the offset of this member of our um, the offset between our listener member and the start of our struct and doing some pointer math to determine, get a pointer to the start of the struct and therefore the rest of the struct. And so is this possible to do in Rust? This is from the Wayland Sys Rust crate, part of the, the Wayland RS project. And so they have a definition of the offset of macro here and a container of to implement the same thing. However, we can see from this to-do comment, is this really not undefined behavior? It turns out this is currently undefined behavior in Rust and there's no sound way to implement this. There is an open RFC that will provide a way to do this in a well-defined way. However, that has not seen a whole lot of progress, I don't think. I'm not totally up to date on the status of that, but eventually Rust will have a, a safe way to do this. But currently this is undefined behavior, though it does work and this library does work. There's also a pure Rust implementation that avoids this issue. But if you want to use bindings to live Wayland, which you would have to do to use WL roots, um, this is not, there's not a sound way to do this in Rust. And so what about Zig? How does Zig solve this problem? We have this wonderful compiler built in. I uh, think talked a lot about, about compiler built in his talk. But Zig exposes this field parent pointer compiler built in, which takes a type. In Zig, we can pass types as first class values at compile time. And it takes a field name. This is the name of the field in our struct for which we provide a pointer. So when you pass a pointer to a field, it compile a type, the name of that field and the type. You can already tell we've got a lot more type safety here than the C macro equivalent. And it's also, we don't need a macro. We already have a compiler built in and it returns as a, point, a pointer to the parent type. So let's now take an example, look at an example of using this whole API in Zig. The first thing we need to do is import the part of Wayland that we want to use. So we'll use this C import compiler built in and assign this whole import to a, a variable C, which we'll use as our namespace. And we will import the Wayland server core. This is from libwayland. And then we'll import something from WL roots just to try this out. We'll import the XCG shell, which is the main desktop shell that applications use for like normal windows on your desktop is what, how you, you would think of that. So we first we import our source. You notice we don't actually need any bindings. This is just, we type in the name of the header and it, it magically imports into Zig code, which I think is really cool. And so, and we got, we are just gonna define our server struct like we did in C. We have my listener is our field. The type is the WL listener from the C namespace. And we call it struct server. And then we have a callback here. So let's go into what's going on here. This is a function. We have our first parameter is a listener. 
what's this question mark here? This is an optional pointer. Zig does not have no pointers, which is really great. And since we're using an external C library, the compiler does not know if this pointer is null or not. So it forces you to use an optional here. And there's an optional pointer to the WL listener, like before. And then we get data, which is a C void, optional pointer to a C void. We say this got the call convention of C, calling convention, so that we can then pass a pointer to this function to libwayland in order to receive our calls. It's a callback and it returns nothing, it returns void. So let's look at how we use field parent pointer here. We just pass the type of our struct, we pass the name of our field, and a pointer to our listener. And we have to de-reference the optional here, but we know this is safe because the glib wayland tells us that it's not going to pass this in the pointer here. So unless we do something wrong, this will be a good point, a safe pointer. So then we can get our, our, our my server pointer. This is now a pointer to our server. And let's look at this next part here. This is also very interesting because remember, if we go back to that example in C, we can see we there's no scary stuff here. It's just data, which is a void pointer, becomes a WR XCG pop-up, which is honestly a little scary because this is a this could be a pointer to literally anything. It's a void pointer in C. And so let's look at how Zig solves this. So here we're doing a pointer cast that's already much more explicit than the C version. And we're casting um, this pointer cast takes two arguments. It takes first the type of what you want to cast a pointer to and then the pointer you want to cast. But we're doing something else here in the second argument. We want to cast this data pointer, but we can't just pass it straight to pointer cast because the compiler doesn't know what the alignment of data is. And Zig cares about alignment. It will not compile if you just pass data directly to pointer cast. You have to first align cast this data pointer and to the alignment of this um, struct in C. And so this is, in my opinion, much better than the C version. Not because it's easier to write, but because it's much more explicit about what's happening and what could go wrong here. If not, if the library passes you the wrong stuff or if you screw something up. And so it's not, you could totally overlook the other thing. It was, it was just, um, this, if, if we did not have these built-ins here and all this, it might seem like noise, but if we just say pop-up equals data, then you're just casting, and you don't know what this is, and you're passing it to your pop-up. So this is, this is very explicit, and it gets the job done without getting in your way. So I really like that aspect of Zig. It's very explicit and readable. So we've checked off one box in our language checklist, grid interoperation with C Wayland libraries. What about the other ones? Fast, Zig is fast. Zig has a goal of beating, of beating C at speed. And it had, the plan to do this is through well-defined, undefined behavior. C, for example, integer overflow in C is undefined for sign, for sign bit type, for signs types. And, and in, for unsigned types, it is actually defined in C. However, Zig makes it undefined behavior for both of them and provides other overflowing operators which it is defined. So this is just one example of how Zig can has made some choices early on in his development. He set it up to be faster than C. And so Zig is also a simple language. This is my first project I've ever attempted in Zig. I literally read about the language and thought it would be worth trying. And so I just started messing around with it, just poking around at it. And I ended up just never stopping. And I have been working on this project for about two months now and have gotten pretty far. This is my first Zig project. I'm not sure I could have done this in other languages like Rust or C++, for example, because they are much more complex. There's a lot more to learn in those languages. In Zig, I already had a fair bit of experience with C, and so that I found translated very well to Zig, and I was able to pick up most of the subtleties of Zig in my first week of, of programming the language. I'm not a master yet by any means, of course, but my knowledge of Zig is enough that I have been able to write a non-trivial program in Zig as my first project ever. So I think that speaks a lot to the ease of learning of Zig and the simplicity of that. And is it easy to write correct code? So this is where we need to look into the what Zig brings to the table that you don't have in C. And so let's talk about a little bit about the, about the benefits of Zig. So we've seen that it's about as simple as C. You can do the same stuff. So why do you want to use Zig? The biggest thing for me is maybe not the most exciting thing, but the optional type is, it's a small language feature, but it's so critical. No, null pointers 
are the cause of so many bugs and having the type the nullability of pointers built into your type system can just make everything much easier to write. And so let's take a look at how this works in Zig. For example, we can implement a linked list using optional pointers. And this is very relevant to Wayland as well, because as we saw earlier, the WL listener type, it cannot move in memory or else we will break pointers that LibWayland is relying on. And so all of our data must be static in memory. It cannot move around. So that means we need to use data structures that preserve pointer stability. And so we'll use linked list primarily. So here we have a list, which contains a first a another struct type. We have a node, which contains an optional pointer to the next node and the previous node, as well as some data. Here we store a view, which would be just like a window on your desktop. And also in the list struct, we store an optional pointer to the first node. And so to iterate over the nodes, we'll notice that we actually have language level constructs in Zig to work with optional pointers which is much nicer than null checks everywhere we see and not knowing when you need to check for null and you don't because null, any pointer could be null really. And so here we set the current to our, the first pointer here is now an optional pointer to a node. And we say while well current, this um, construct here, while well current, and then we have got these, these um, uh, line braces. I'm not really sure what to call these, honestly. And so if current is null, we will, end the loop. If current is non-null, then we will take the inner value of current. So node is going to just be a non-optional pointer to a node, and node, a pointer that we know must be valid. And so we can then do something with node inside of this loop. And then for the next iteration, we set current to the next node, and then check again if current is equal to null or not in this nice language level construct that makes working with optional pointers much nicer. And so that's one major feature of Zig. I mean, I kind of write in state enough how much just having optional type, the optional type changes your code and makes everything so much easier to read. So the next really cool feature of Zig, in my opinion, is nice error handle. C doesn't really have any error handling built into the language. It's all based on returning sentinel values or returning false. It doesn't have rules built into the language anyways. So returning something that would evaluate the false. And and so Zig has made some big strides here. So we can define an error set. And this is just a set of possible errors that could occur for some language. So we, we're going to talk about the compositor commands. Use these as an example here. So we're parsing a command that could be run in our compositor. It could be, we could receive not a command, something that's not a command, or an unknown command, or not enough arguments were given, or too many arguments, or we failed to allocate and ran out of memory. So let's look at some usage. I'm sorry, there's a lot of code here, but I think it will demonstrate kind of the control flow of Zig with regard to errors. So here we receive an args list, which is just a, a slice of slices. So you can think of, this, think of this as a pointer to a two-dimensional array of sorts. And so if we have no arguments in our argument list, we can just return error.no command. And notice our return type. Here we've got a union of a command. We either return a valid command or return an error. And so here we can just return an error and we'll automatically converse with this return type. And so first thing we would do here is look at our first argument and see if we can find this thing in our list of definitions of, of valid command. If we just compare some memory and see if this argument is equal to the one of the definitions, then we'll return the definition. We'll set, the, set this variable to the definition, otherwise we will return the unknown command error. And then finally, we will construct our command using the definition, which is now a, contains a function pointer that we can use to run the command, as well as um, trying to parse the rest of the arguments into um, the arg we want to pass the command. So here we have this try keyword. So that means that this arg.parse function can also return an error, which would be then one of these errors, which would also automatically get returned here. And if this doesn't return an error, then it will assign the result of this, which would be an arg to this, this value and return the command. So this airflow, this um, control flow really gets out of your way. It allows you to just call functions with the try keyword to automatically return an error if they fail. And then and that, in this way, you can pass your errors up the call stack with minimal effort. And you can also, and it's just easier to work with a set of errors where you know 
the all the errors can possibly occur. It's not just sentinel values where it's easy to mess up. If, in, if you for the sentinel values, it's not encoded in the return type that there can be a sentinel. And so you need to like read the documentation to see that, oh, I need to check for minus one here. If it's minus one, that's an error. Instead here, you you um, you see this an error and also it becomes then a compile error to not handle the error. For example, if we left this try out here, or pile, compile because the, this returns not an arg, but an arg union with an, the, the error that can be returned by this function. And so that would not coerce into this type. And so this makes um, writing correct code in ZIG much easier than it is in C. And so the other major feature of ZIG, which is an anti feature, maybe you can say, is not having macros. And so we already saw one nice macro that's used in w let's look. Let's look at another nice macro we have. This is to work with the intrusive linked lists we saw earlier. And there's this macro, WL list for each. So this, this code probably looks kind of weird. It's like, this looks like a function call, but then we've got uh, opening curly brace after it, and we're like iterating over a loop. And so it turns out inserting a for loop here, and it's using these parameters to determine what the for loop is going to look like, and just to save you some code writing. So the, you can see the macro definition here. It's creating a for loop using, again, this WL container of macro. And this quickly becomes kind of unreadable. So when you see this kind of code for the first time, re reading Wayland code, it can be very confusing. And it's not obvious at all what's going on here. Or, I mean, you can see that it's iterating or something, but what are these parameters? And you don't really get the types that you can with ZIG. And so I consider this an anti-feature, which is having to rely on macros to do stuff, simple stuff like iterate over a linked list. And so in ZIG, we have this feature called comp time, which is really nice. It allows us to do all sorts of stuff. So let's go back to our list example earlier. Earlier, we just had it one parameter. We only have views as its type. Here, we'll, instead of, We'll make a generic list. And how we use this in Zig is we create a function that returns a type and takes the type as a parameter. Zig doesn't really have generics. It just has the ability to pass types around its first class values that compile. And with that, you can easily make generics in that you just have a function that takes a type as a value. Then given that type value, we create our own struct. So this is similar to the list definition we had earlier. Sorry. And we create a node, again, with these optional pointers and except data is now t, which is this type we were passed here. And so then we return this type from our function, and that's all it is. Then we can just call this function whenever we want to get the generic type based on what we passed to this function. And so this means we don't need to do this to have nice iteration over the list, and we don't need to use an intrusive list either. So this um, is a really nice way to keep the language simple, while at the same time having nice features like generics and not needing to rely on macros to get the job done. And so I think that's a pretty solid argument of why ZIG is worth considering. If you have a project that's low enough level that you need to really interface with complex C libraries and rely well with C, while at the same time, yeah, you need to have a, a nice language you can work with. I mean, I'd much rather write ZIG code than C code because of these nice features we have in a much more language. So if you want to, if you're interested in my project and my work in this compositor, feel free to check out the GitHub or talk to me on Discord or IRC. And thank you for listening. Okay. Thank you very much, Isaac. Uh, let's move to the Q&A now. Um, so just a reminder for uh, everybody, um, same as before, if you have a question for Isaac, you can use Twitch chat, the Zig IRC channel on Freenode, or the Zig programming language Discord server. Just make sure to tag me on it. Um, and let's move to the Q&A view then. So Isaac, let me, let me first of all, center you a little bit better because you have a different ratio than the others. Okay. Um, so uh, let me start by uh, the user question. So you, you mentioned already that um, you discovered Zig then on uh, Hacker News, right, on something, and you immediately yeah, yeah. went to work into uh, to, to this project, right? No, yeah, well, not immediately. I mean, I'd read about Zig at some point. And so when I was thinking about writing my own compositor, Zig was kind of in the back of my mind as a possibility. I had, I had never really done anything with the language besides read their, their documentation on their website and just like see a couple of examples. But 
I guess it stuck with me that you could just import C libraries and use them directly. Okay, I see. Um, uh, are, is there any other project that have you been working on other than Reaver? Um, along in Zig, not yet. Though I will definitely be writing some companion apps for Reaver. I guess I, I still need to write a status bar, which I consider out of scope for the compositor itself, and so that's likely going to be in Zig. And I'm I also have a lock screen for Wayland that's currently written in Rust. But I've been considering rewriting it in Zig because I think I could be, it could be made a lot simpler than it is currently. So I'll definitely be using Zig for future projects, though, as I just really like the language. It's a joy to work with, to be honest. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, I think there's a question from Kay Proti. Uh, is River's goal to be our replacement for Lib Wayland? No, no. River does not... Or, wait... River, River is a compositor. So this is like the this is like Sway or GNOME or KDE or any other window manager. And so what this does, I mean, I can demo it if you want. Okay, give me a second. I'll switch back to the other view. Okay, we, we can now see. Uh, keep in mind that your uh, font size is very small. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, but now we're, we are in River, so we can just like spawn some terminals and uh, we can run htop. It doesn't really matter what the, it's displayed on the font, but we can mm -hmm. see that there already are some features working on the compositor. We've got um, kind of a, a, a layout like DWM where it's dynamic and our, we can open an editor here and I don't know, edit something. And so if we want to like focus on our view, pop it up to our, up to, um, our main view. And we also have tags here. So we could send this view to the second tag, and we could view the second tag and go back to the viewing the first tag. So this is River. It's a compositor. It's a window manager as well. And I really enjoyed writing it and enjoy using it as well. So hopefully that explains a little bit more about what River is. Like I said, I do a great job of explaining the project itself about the language I was using. <laughs> okay, I, I see a lot of comments. Uh, people on Twitter are saying that it, it's pretty sleek. <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely looks awesome. Um, okay, so you mentioned that. Uh, so you started using Z around that uh, this time. You don't have any major projects. Uh, you're gonna pl you're planning to write a few companion apps. Uh, mm. um, any other thing um, that you uh, you are interested in writing that uh, you might do in the future? Yeah, so let me think about that for a second. Sure. And so one thing, so this I've may, I mentioned briefly that I had written a, a lock screen on Rust already. And so one cool thing you could do in wait with Wayland is that the lock screen could also be a Wayland compositor or a very about a very limited one. And so you could theoretically run any Wayland app as to to give you the graphics for your lock screen. For example, you could run like MPV, like a video player to then play a video as your lock screen, but still run that inside the lock screen compositor, that your, your computer would be locked, but it would be displaying a video. So I think that would be a pretty cool thing to do, but that gets rather complicated. So I'd rather do that in Zig than Rust, to be honest. I see, that's awesome. So w one thing that I'm thinking, maybe maybe this is just, uh, I don't know, you tell me if it's something that, that doesn't make sense, but, um, is, is there any connection to what, at the end of the day, also OBS is doing, for example, when composing uh, a, a scene that is broadcasted on stream? Um, not sure I understand the question. But, well, um, have you ever used OBS? No, I've never used OBS. <laughs> okay, well, so for example, w when I uh, when I use OBS, I can do more or less what you were describing earlier. Uh, of course, it's a different layer of the stack, so it's not a one-to-one -one, um, uh, um, mapping, let's say. Uh, but uh, in, in OBS, you can set up a scene where you have a bunch of sources. For example, right now I'm showing a uh, overlay. There's your webcam in the corner. Then there's another source in the middle of the screen that is showing your desktop. And right. yeah, so it, yeah, please continue. Yeah, so it's a similar idea. Definitely, it sounds like they're both doing compositing, which is just like taking a bunch of parts together and putting them together into one image or one buffer to be displayed on an output. However, Wayland 
works quite differently than OD, OBS, I believe, in that it's it's kind of restri- it's not a network transparent protocol, meaning that you can't is the network you ha- it has to pass file buffers around in order to achieve this shared memory model. In Wayland, all every application renders directly to a file to a to a buffer, which is then used directly by the compositor without copying stuff around. This is what allows Wayland to be potentially much more efficient than X11 with its rendering and be much more energy efficient as well, saving your battery life and whatnot. However, this you can't really pass a file descriptor over the network and expect things to work out. I see. Um, but, okay, another question. Um, how does... Uh, so I, I know, I, I understand that the two things are not uh, exactly... Uh, compatible because um, I, I see that you you have these tiling set up where everything is well organized and hierarchical. But um, uh, what happened to? I remember when I was um, using Linux a while ago before I got like lazy and moved to macOS and yeah, pre- pretty much stayed there. Um, but uh, what happened with uh, Compits, Burial, and all the three D crazy effects and wobbly Windows? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so you definitely want to check out a compositor called Wayfire. That's another Wayland compositor that's using WL Roots, and they have um, all these wobbly windows and fun stuff. They also have like fire windows, and like so the window just like drops down while, like with a burning animation. It's pretty cool. So you can definitely do that stuff with Wayland as well. But you have to implement it in the compositor, not in like a um, another client like you would do in X. That's Way Wayfire. Oh, okay, I see, I see. Uh, okay, so we have a couple of uh, we have a question. So, um, do you plan to use River as your main driver eventually? Yes, yes, that is my top priority right now. Is to get to the point where I can use it for all my stuff. There's only a few things blocking me right now. X Wayland already works pretty well, and um, I've already got most of the protocols implemented that I need. Um, the only things blocking me are like easy configuration and a status bar, and so. I'm develop, working on a custom Wayland protocol that will allow the compositor to talk to the status bar. And so once that's done, I can either patch some existing status bar or write my own to have a nice status bar at the bottom, which will keep me... It's just much nicer to use a compositor with a status bar, in my opinion. And then the other thing is having good configuration. I already have a River CTL program. I can demo this also real quick. Big cache in River CTL. Um, zoom. Let's just zoom to the next view. And so instead of using the key bind there, I've just like run for another separate binary, which then talks to my compositor through a custom way protocol and then tells the compositor to, to uh, do the zoom command, which is just zooming to the next window. Or if I have a window that's not the master window focused, focusing that window. And so that already works, but I don't ha- yet have the, cap- the capability to bind keys using this River CTL program, so I need to implement that. And once that's implemented, all the configuration can be done just through a shell script, calling River CTL and binding all your key bindings and performing all these commands just through a shell script. Right now, most of the stuff is still hard coded. So once I get that stuff de hard coded and get my bar worked out, I'll be using this full time. Mm-hmm. Um, we have another question from uh, Johnny Marler. Uh, does Wayland support something like X11 forwarding? X11 forwarding. So it's not the same thing. Um, Wayland, so right now I'm streaming this. I'm, I'm using Sway right now. This is streaming to you over WebRTC using um, the WLR, WLR screen copy protocol and um, WebRTC and Pipewire and a couple other technologies. So this is not the same thing as exporting. It works quite differently. It's just streaming the whole entire buffer, but in a nice, efficient, compressed way. And exporting, as I explained earlier, doesn't isn't can't really be done with Wayland. At least no one's figured it out yet because of this problem of passing file descriptors around, which can't be done over the network, or at least no one's figured out a good way to do it yet. Hopefully that answers your question. Mm-hmm. Um, how easy is it to write uh, Wayland clients in Zig? Asks uh, Jones. Um, well, it's about the same as writing them in C. Um, I haven't actually written a Wayland client. Actually, yeah, the River River CTL is a Wayland client, so I can show you the source code for this real quick. Actually, I can even do this inside River River CTL. So how this works is 
we just import waylandclient.h this is our C import thing and we import the header from my custom protocol and then we connect to the display we connect we get the registry which shows all the wayland globals we have this writing this may inquire some uncertain understanding of wayland but you'll probably be learning more about um wayland itself than debugging writing a wayland um, um client in zig but you can see this client is not very long there's only a little bit of code obviously it would take a lot more code to write a graphical client but um this is a very simple demonstration of how a wayland client can be set up and function so if you want to check out the full quote source codes on github of course i linked that earlier i can link it again i guess at some point but yeah uh yeah i, I, I would think... definitely recommend it yeah, I, I think other people also uh, linked it in chat. So uh, we have another uh, question. So uh, it's a bit long. Let me read it all for you. Uh, and somebody else is also posting a link again. That's awesome. Uh, thank you. So um, the question is, Isaac, you mentioned that uh, there were some things you didn't really like uh, about uh, Zway and how it manages Windows. Uh, I don't have much experience with uh, Linux Windows programming. Can you explain how the compositing code uh, can affect uh, writing a desktop app? And what are the things River does differently than Zway? So my my issues with Sway are mostly on um, its manual Windows management. So let's go back to Sway real quick, actually. I can demonstrate this. So now we're back in Sway on my normal desktop. So you can see that when I'm opening new terminals, they always appear next to each other, unless I explicitly say you should appear down below. And it's all manual here. And I can't just like say, remake this terminal bigger. I can make it full screen, but I can't just make it to the left. And so you can see this works very differently than how things work in River. And that when we make new terminals, they're automatically tiled in this in this layout and we can automatically snap other wind terminals to the, to the main view so that's the main difference between river and sway river is doing what's known as dynamic window management which was popularized by dwm made by suckless software which is called the dyna dynamic window manager but there is not a or at least to my knowledge no one's written a dynamic window manager for wayland yet so that's what i set out to do okay uh i think that's that's awesome uh thank you very much thank you for um uh, preparing the presentation also for answering the questions uh that's that's an interesting project um and it, it, like i think the demo really uh really uh, sells uh like uh, the the idea behind the project so thank you very much um and i think it's time for us to move uh to um the final part of the session today. Uh, thank you again, um, Isaac. Right. Uh, you can now go. Thank you. Bye bye. So, okay, let me see where where are we now. Um, so yeah, we are nearing the end of the first episode. Uh, thank you again. Thank you to both speakers. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, Isaac. You were both great. Um, before I announce and do a couple of service announcements. Well, first of all. Uh, the next episode is already scheduled for next Sunday, so not tomorrow, the one eight days from now. And uh, at the end, you will see uh, more information about it uh, in the final uh, splash screen. And second, I'm working on making it easier to um, access the schedule um, and, the call for, uh, and the call for speakers. So please keep an ear out for related announcements in the next few days. And I guess it's now time to call Andrew. So as before, give me a moment uh, so that I can set everything up. Thank you.
Okay, we are ready. So, um, Andrew, I don't think you need any introduction. So I would say the stream is yours. Hey, everybody. Uh, thank you, Boris. Uh, this is great. I am so happy to see this happening right now. Um, Benjamin, you did a great talk. Uh, that was really informative. It was fun and it was exciting and useful. So thank you. And you clearly put a lot of effort into preparing that. So thank you. That's really, that's great content. Um, likewise with Isaac, it's clear that you prepared, you practiced, you have like content ready to go. It's really cool. Uh, thank you for, for investing your time in that. It's, you know, we, we you're, you're creating, uh, you're, you're creating opportunities for other people to learn and get involved and grow their careers and, and that, all that kind of stuff, right? Like you're, you're putting the effort in that, that makes, uh, this project have life. So thank you for that. And thank you to, uh, Boris for, um, starting all this, uh, for starting a uh, Zig Showtime and for that lit intro. That was awesome. Um, right. And I, I love this idea because. The whole point of Zig is to enable people to create. That's it. We want people to be able to create programs, create learning material for other people, help each other grow, help each other learn. Um, and the whole point of Zig is to get out of your way so that you can do that. So uh, Zig's Showtime is a, a wonderful format for the community to help each other uh, just create with each other. Uh, so I'm super into this and I want to encourage everyone, uh, to, uh, get involved. If you feel like some, you know, if, if you feel like you have an idea, like maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm interested in, um, I don't know, games or memes or whatever, but I don't know if my content is good enough. Who cares? Just try it out. You know, um, you can make a blog post, you can, uh, submit your, uh, your talk to, uh, to Loris so we can do another Zig show time. Like we're all just here just to hang out and, and to create with each other. Um, and I love that. Super happy to, to see this happening. Uh, let's see, what else have I got here? Okay, I have one note about um, the Zig community and then I have a sort of like teaser announcement. Uh, one thing that I think is worth pointing out is the, um, sort of decentralized nature of the Zig community. Uh, I don't think that we have a the community of Zig. And I think that that's, I think that that's a, a strength because everyone's different. People like to communicate with each other in different ways. They like to uh, have different patterns of interacting. They like to operate under different rules. And that's okay. You know, um, there doesn't have to be a monolithic way that it's supposed to work. And so that's what I, experimented with just by putting a little note in the wiki. That's all I did as I just wrote on the wiki. Uh, there's no, there's no the community. There's no official community. It's just whoever wants to take charge, whoever wants to create a place for people to gather, do whatever. Great. Do it. So make your own rules, get people to want to join you, do it your way. And, and that's, that's the, that's the decentralized way that, that we're doing this because, uh, that's how we can avoid, you know, one central entity controlling us and, you know, getting t telling us like, oh, well, we have all the money, so you have to do what we want. You know, we're, we're stronger than that by being decentralized. Um, and so I really appreciate uh, Lori is taking the, um, taking the effort to just create this showtime. I, I didn't, I didn't tell him to do it. He just said, I'm going to make this thing happen. And he made it happen. That's, that's exactly the spirit that, uh, that's going to make this project succeed. Um, right. Okay. And finally, uh, I have an announcement about the Zig Software Foundation. Uh, Zig Software Foundation is an officially recognized nonprofit entity in New York State. Uh, it is. It's active. It's we've, we've had our first uh, board meeting. We've. Uh, passed the resolution to get a bank account. So things are happening. The last step in the process is getting official uh, tax exempt status from the IRS. And once that happens, I'm gonna make an official 
big announcement on the internet, try to get some um, try to get some more donations from from different organizations that have a budget for donating to nonprofits, and try to hire people. So that's going to be the next step here. Um, as Benjamin Fang noted, I am but one person. I'm currently the only person getting paid to merge pull requests, deal with issues, do all this stuff. And uh, I would love to bring more money into the ecosystem and just help people, you know, actually be able to make a living doing at least, at least to some degree, we can get some people to make a living doing this. Um, so that's what I'm trying to accomplish. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, my lawyer is working on the last step of getting IRS tax exempt status. And after that is the big, you know, public announcement to um, try to try to get some more uh, cash flow so that we can hire people. And that's it. That's all I have for you. So I'm going to ask uh, Loris to take over again. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Looking forward to the next Zig Showtime. Thank you very much, Andrew. Wow, that's awesome. So uh, I actually uh, put you in like the view. You're not seeing it probably, but uh, there's your name on top and underneath uh, Zig Software Foundation president. So I guess that was uh, uh, the right choice. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, thank you very much. So we can now move uh, to the end. This is the end of the first Zig Showtime episode. Um, Thank you everyone for watching. I I hope you had fun and I hope to see you all again uh, on the 7th of June for the second episode. So I guess let's roll the outro. <laughs>